Christ the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Welcome to worship uh, on this second Sunday of Easter. And I uh, wish to uh, welcome all of our guests that are here today. Uh, this is a, a joyous occasion in that we are baptizing Jack uh, Stephen Shetler today. And he is receiving uh, the embrace of Jesus Christ in this water of, of, of the sacrament of baptism. And so uh, Jack is, is the, the son of, of Lane and Jamie Shetler, and we are, um, we're glad that you, you chose to be in this church for, for the baptism, your church, Lane. And um, I had so wished that we could have been in our renewed space upstairs. Um, but as I said to you yesterday, uh, I was hoping Jack would be the first baptism in our new font, but he's going to be the last one in our old font, and that's a, that's a special thing as, as well. And so uh, I also want to say that as, uh, this is a joyful, joyful occasion. At the same time, uh, we, do, uh, we do miss Clissy uh, and your beloved wife and your beloved uh, mother and our, our very good friend here at Zion. And yet, uh, in reflecting on this, I, I've been, uh, been thinking that the, the closest place that we can be to the people that we love is is when we come close to Jesus Christ. And, and Clissy is in the arms of, of Jesus and uh, in the sacraments of, of baptism and the sacrament of Holy Communion. Uh, this is where Jesus comes very close to touch us. And so uh, we are very close to Clissy in the celebration of these, of these sacraments today. So in that, in that way, it's, it's, it's sorrowful and yet joyful at the same time. And so, uh, what I do want to say to our guests, uh, our communion practice, uh, we, uh, we welcome all people who are baptized and truly believe that Jesus is, uh, is present with uh, uh, the bread and the wine of, 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 uh, of Holy Communion, uh, with his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins, all who are baptized and believe. Um, when we, if, you, if you are not baptized and you'd like to come forward to receive a blessing at the time of the sacrament, that would be fine, too. Just indicate that to me by crossing your arms. Uh, but as we receive our, our sacrament of Holy Communion today, uh, we'll be coming um, from the sides and, and just space yourselves out as we go. Um, there's individual glasses that will be uh, there to be picked up. I'll be uh, distributing the, the body of Christ right here and... Uh, then you can, you can move to the sides and there'll be pouring chalices where you can receive the blood of Christ. And at that point, you can return your glass to one of the empty trays there. And so uh, we get to celebrate the sacrament of communion. And remember that Jesus Christ truly is risen and with us. And so uh, we begin with our entrance hymn. Please stand. of God. I want to look at Jesus. Clear sun of righteousness shine on my path and show me the way to the Father. In him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. I'm looking for the coming of Christ. I want to be with Jesus. 
When we have run with patience the race, we shall know the joy of Jesus. In him there is no darkness at all, the night and the day are both the light. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Holy is the Lord, the Almighty. He was, he is, and he is to come. He is worthy of glory and honor and power. He created all things by his will and decree. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain. By his blood he purchased for God. People of every race and tongue and every tribe and nation. Christ made of them a kingdom. And priests to serve our God. And they shall reign on earth forever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty God, we have celebrated with joy the festival of our Lord's resurrection. Graciously help us to show the power of the resurrection and all that we say and do. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the congregation may be seated, and I wish to invite forward uh, Lane and Jamie and, and Jack and all the other members of the family that would like to gather around, godparents, and uh, you can all gather in a circle right here um, around, and if you want to stand very good right there for me and if you want to come In holy baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father liberates us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. By the water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, which is the body of Christ. As we live with him and with his people, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Would you please present Jack Stevens? And in Christian love, you have presented Jack for holy baptism. You should therefore faithfully bring him to the services of God's house and teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments. And as he grows in years, you should place in his hands the Holy Scriptures and provide for his instruction in the Christian faith that living in the covenant of his baptism and in communion with the church, he may lead a godly life until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you promise to fulfill these obligations? Please answer, I do. I do. All right. And with the congregation, please stand. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, we give you thanks for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters and you created heaven and earth. By the gift of water you nourish and sustain us and all living things. By the waters of the flood you condemn the wicked and save those whom you had chosen, Noah and his family. You led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea, out of slavery into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of the Jordan, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, your beloved son has set us free from the bondage to sin and death 
and has opened the way to the joy and freedom of everlasting life. He made water a sign of the kingdom and of cleansing and rebirth. In obedience to his command, we make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit so that he who is here baptized may be given new life. Wash away the sin of him who is cleansed by this water and bring him forth as an inheritor of your glorious kingdom. To you be given praise and honor and worship through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I ask you to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and all his empty promises? If so, please answer, I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Jack Stephen Shetler, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us pray. If you could step just back a little bit. Then you can move back with your hands on your side. Let us pray. O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for freeing your sons and daughters from the power of sin and for raising them up to a new life through this holy sacrament. Pour your Holy Spirit upon Jack Stephen Shetler, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. Amen. Jack Stephen Shetler, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. We put on this baptismal garment. For in baptism, you have been clothed in the righteousness of, of Christ, who calls you to his great feast. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all life, look with kindness upon Lane and Jamie. Let them ever rejoice in the gift you've given them. Make them teachers and examples of righteousness for Jack. Strengthen them in their own baptism so they may share eternally with their child the salvation you have given them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we also have here the, the baptismal certificate and a, and a faith chest. That's something to place uh, milestones of, uh, of his life, especially his life uh, with Christ in that box. And always remember his, his baptism in this day when he was, he was brought into the, the Lord's family by the sacrament of holy baptism. And so through baptism, God has made this new brother a member of the priesthood we all share in Christ Jesus, 
that we may proclaim the praise of God and bear his creative and redeeming word to all the world. We welcome you into the Lord's family. We receive you as a fellow member of the body of Christ, child of the same heavenly father, and worker with us in the kingdom of God. For a minute. <laughs> okay. And so, I'm going to take a little walk with him. I'm going to introduce you to the newest member of Zion Lutheran Church in Turbotville. This is, this is Jack Stephen Shetler. And uh, we're so very glad that uh, we were able to share this sacrament with him today. And I know of the faithfulness of his parents and how they'll keep the, the covenant of holy baptism with him. As the years as the years go by, and so there's your beautiful boy. <laughs> okay, and and so welcome, and uh, we'll continue our our worship with the word, and so everybody may be seated. A reading from Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each of any, of, as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How good and pleasant it is to live together in you. How good and pleasant it is to live together in unity. It is like oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. How good and pleasant it is to live together in unity. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. From there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. How good and pleasant it is to live together in unity.
we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we have made him a liar, and then the Lord's word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. It is he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So on this Easter Sunday, or this Sunday after Easter, we we need to ask this question. If I believe in the the resurrection, so what? Uh, What difference does that make? If we believe in the resurrection of Jesus, what should we be doing? Uh, Where should we be going? How should we be living? The answers, fortunately for us, are in uh, this passage of St. John's Gospel that is before us. When Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room after his resurrection, we can say that he shows us, he sends us, and he gives us. He shows us the future. He sends us out into the world on the basis of that future. And he gives us what we need for accomplishing that mission. So let's look at those three things. First of all, Jesus shows us the future. Consider this. When we look at Jesus, 
uh, that we see in the, in, the, in the Gospels, the risen Jesus, we're really looking at our own future. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have died. Just like when you, you get a crop of, of something, flowers or vegetables or something, when they start to come up from the ground and you get that, that first fruit and you know that more is coming, think of tomatoes, right? You know how you finally get that first tomato and then watch out, they're coming, right? And you better have something to do with all those tomatoes when they show up, uh, canning or whatever. Well, that's the way it works. Jesus is the first fruit of, of many to come. When Jesus comes up from the grave, uh, you know that more resurrections are coming. And they will be just like the first resurrection. So what was that first resurrection like? Well, number one, it was physical. Jesus stood among the frightened disciples as a physical body. Um, he wasn't a ghost. He wasn't an apparition. He wasn't just some sort of a, a vision or phantasm. The resurrected Jesus was and is a human body today. Think about that. Jesus risen from the dead, and he is also ascended into heaven. Now, we might ask the question, well, where's heaven? You know, we've, we've sent rockets up, and we know we haven't found heaven there. Uh, there's, there's a theologian I really love, N.T. Wright, and he, he talks about how heaven is all around us, and it's, it's close to us, but it's veiled. And Jesus can pass from heaven to earth to be with us, uh, and, and we cannot, uh, but, but heaven is, is the nearness, the presence of God, and that presence will one day remake this world. So Jesus ascended, and he's at the right hand of the Father, and that means he's still very, very close to us. And Jesus is as real as you or I, uh, but he is beyond death, beyond the grave, and that's why Jesus can make the marvelous promises he makes. One who has risen from the dead can never die again, and so his promises he can keep. Now, this is very different from the Greek and the Roman uh, train of thought that uh, was around during the time of the gospel writer. The Greeks and Romans believed that, that when you died, that was the end of the body, and your soul moved on to another world, a world of perfection, unlike this dirty physical world. Um, my undergraduate degree was in philosophy, which is a very boring degree to get. Uh, but we used to read a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of Plato. You ever heard of Plato? And he's not the guy from Beetle Bailey that writes on, all over the wall, you know, if you remember him. Uh, Plato was a philosopher um, who really uh, put this idea out there that, that uh, our body is something to be escaped and our soul comes from another world. And it's the perfect world of forms, he called it. And so uh, the whole goal of philosophy to, was to think yourself out of your body and, and allow your soul, uh, which is your true self, to get to this other world. Uh, some of that thought has found its way into, into Christian thinking, but it's not what Jesus showed us in his resurrection. Jesus in his resurrection showed us something very different. The risen Jesus Christ showed us that our future is intended to be lived for all eternity in a physical body. Just like we confess every week in the creeds, I believe in the resurrection of the body. And our belief is based on this, this biblical witness that Jesus rose from death and, and existed that way. Jesus' body was ordinary in many ways. Think about it. Jesus showed the disciples the scars in his hands and in his feet and his side and he even invited them to, to touch him, right? Uh, in other gospel stories, Jesus said, see that I have flesh and bones. He wanted to show that he was real. And he ate fish after his resurrection on two occasions that are at least written of. Once saying that he was hungry do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And another time, when the disciples were out fishing, uh, he called them in, and he had a big fish fry going on uh, on the shore for breakfast, and he invited them to come in and eat with him. Jesus was showing us our future. We will rise bodily from death, from the grave, and we will be ordinary. We will eat and drink and be available to the touch. A physical resurrection is in our future, just like Jesus. But there's more. Notice in our gospel lesson for today that although the disciples are in a locked room, uh, that Jesus came and he stood among them. You know, how did he do that? Did he simply appear? You know, did he walk through the wall? Or was he a good 
lock picker, you know, or maybe, maybe it's that veil of heaven and earth that he passed through. Um, in another story from St. Luke, Jesus is unrecognizable to two followers on their way home to Emmaus on Easter afternoon. Do you remember that story? Uh, the Cleopas and companion are walking sad from, from, uh, from Jerusalem to their home in Emmaus, seven miles away, and Jesus comes alongside them, asks them why they're sad, and they say it's, it's Jesus of Nazareth, he's died, and, and he spends the next you know, hour or two explaining to them from all the scriptures just exactly why the Messiah needed to die and rise again. So, by the way, I want you to notice that what's the very first thing that the risen, resurrected Jesus Christ does uh, on, on that Easter Sunday? He holds a Sunday school class. How do you like that? It shows how important Sunday school was to Jesus. He taught from the Bible to these two followers. Well, they finally got to see Jesus and understand who he was when they sat at the table with him. And he broke bread at the table. They recognized him for who he was, but then he disappeared from them again. So what does all that mean? It means that somehow Jesus is physically risen and Jesus is ordinary. And at the same time, Jesus, when resurrected, is more than he was before his death. And this points to our future, too. Um, We will be... uh, A resurrected bodily and a resurrected body will be more than it is in this lifetime. Now, St. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about this. Paul is thinking about his impending death, and, and he writes about what that will be like. He starts off by describing this earthly existence, then he moves on to what will be. This is what he says. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul is saying that in the resurrection, we're moving way up from a body like an, an, an old moldy torn tent to a body like a brand spanking new building. Um, and God has it stored in the heavens for us. It's got our name on it. And then he goes on. For while we are still in this tent, that means this body, this life, we groan being burdened. Not that we would want to be unclothed, out of the body, but that we want to be fully clothed, further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So what's he saying? Paul is saying that while we are in our body, we groan, you know, we feel the decay, we feel the aging, we feel the limitations of our physical body, we feel our balding heads, right? <laughs> our tent is coming, going to tatters, right? But we don't want to be unclothed. We don't want our soul out of our body. We want to be further clothed, that our body be swallowed up by life. And what's his point? That our future physical bodies will be even more full of life than they are right now. That will be our future. And when we see each other in the new heaven and the new earth that God creates, we'll be astonished. Uh, There's one theologian, Jonathan Edwards, that compared who we are now uh, as an acorn to what we will be as a fully grown oak tree. That's how different the resurrected life will be in the new heaven and new earth. And we will see each other and we will say, ah, I always knew you had it in you. Look at you. Aren't you glorified and wonderful and perfected by Christ? That will be our future. And Jesus is showing that to us as he appears to his disciples in that first Easter day. Our resurrection will be like his, physical, ordinary, and swallowed up by life, more life than we, uh, than we can imagine right now. Now, second point is that Jesus in that upper room with his disciples, he sends us on the basis of that future. We've got a future, a resurrected future with him. So he sends us out on a mission. Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I now send you. And if you were reading that in Latin, which you probably wouldn't want to, Uh, Jesus would be using the word missio, I am sent. Missio, of course, that's our word mission, right? Jesus is saying, I am a missionary now, and that means that all of you are missionaries as well. Jesus came uh, to seek and save the lost. He says that throughout the Gospels. I have come to seek and save the lost. Jesus is saying that he has come to conduct a rescue mission to save the world from all of the deadly effects of sin. Jesus has come not to condemn the world, but to save the world. 
He has come to rescue everyone and everything spiritually and physically. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth, he went back to the synagogue and uh, he asked to read. And uh, he reads from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he reads this part of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now that's a rescue mission. And then he rolls up the scroll and he sits down and he looks at all the people and he says, Today uh, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is on a rescue mission to seek and save the lost. And now we are on that mission too. We know that Jesus has an amazing future in store for us. And we are the people who are energized and driven by what will be. You see, we live on this earth. We live with God's creation, every creature, every person, knowing that they are God's beloved creation. And we work to live God's future peace, God's future wholeness in the here and now. The creation is imperfect now. People are marred tragically by sin. Yet by the power of the resurrection, our future hope, we want to live now what will be our future one day. One of my professors from seminary, Robert Jensen, um, and by the way, he he died just, just recently, and he was uh, declared the, um, the, the, foremost, uh, uh, the, the, the foremost theologian of North America in, from the 20th century. Uh, but you need to know that the foremost theologian of the 20th century in North America thought that I was abysmally stupid. So <laughs> um, he, would, he, would, he would say, uh, Pastor Elkin had him in classes too, right? And yep. we were all terrified of him, weren't we? Absolutely. <laughs> But boy, we, you could learn from him, and his books were amazing. Um, and uh, I had my senior interview with him and two other uh, professors, and um, the other professors really liked me, and he was really tough on me. He, he definitely frightened me. So anyway, but you could learn so much from him. Now, in his book, Lutheranism, um, about living the f he talked about living the future in the here and now. Sometimes he's called a futurist because of that. But he talked in that book about the most powerful argument that he knew of during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. That one day in the kingdom of God to come, people of all races, racially different from each other, will be brothers and sisters and even elders. So we had better treat each other in the here and now how we will one day treat each other in the new heaven and the new earth. I think that's a, a good rationale for our Christ-given mission in all of our lives. All of those people with, with whom you struggle, live with them now as you will one day live with them in the kingdom to come. Practice that. Rehearse it, knowing that, that someday you will live with them. Getting along with them now as you will get along with them in, in the future, in eternity. Bring that eternity into the here and now. Live with the energy and the life and the love of what is to come in our resurrected lives. Do it right now. That's how to be with people. Martin Luther is famously quoted as saying, if I knew the Lord was coming tomorrow, I would plant a tree. Now, often he is misunderstood when, when, uh, when he's quoted. And it doesn't mean, as many people might think, well, if I know Jesus was coming back tomorrow, I would just carry on with my normal life and let just Jesus handle what will come, right? But no, that's not what he means. Instead, what Luther means by that is, if Jesus is coming tomorrow, I will go out and plant a tree. Because just imagine how it will flourish. Imagine how it will grow as God recreates the heaven and the earth. This is the earth that he's going to recreate. And so he's going to make it grow. He's going to make it flourish. He's going to set everything right. And wouldn't you want to see a tree grow up in that? Now, that is, that is a call to follow the mission of Jesus to seek and save the lost, to bring Jesus' wholeness and healing to bear upon every person and situation, knowing that Jesus will bring it to his followers in his time. We, in other words, we want to be tree planters, knowing how much God will bring his, his growth and fullness and perfection. So we know, we know what our resurrection future will be. That's our first point. There, 
The resurrected Jesus shows that to us. And then Jesus shows us, or sends us out into the world on the basis of that future. And finally, the third point. Jesus gives us what we need for that mission. Notice that when the risen Jesus shows up among his disciples after the resurrection, uh, the first word out of his mouth is peace. Peace be with you. In other words, in Hebrew, it's shalom, wholeness or well-being, everything working together in God-given harmony. That's what shalom is all about. And that's what Jesus offers to his disciples on that Easter day, peace. What Jesus is actually giving us here is, is hope. Now, I know that the word hope isn't used in this gospel story we read today, but that's what Jesus is giving to us when he greets his disciples with the word peace. He's giving us hope. Uh, now, the biblical idea of hope uh, is not served well by the way we use it in our English language today. In English, we hope uh, for something only when we're not sure about it. In other words, gee, I sure hope so, you know. Um, I sure hope that the, the Baltimore Orioles win the World Series someday. I'm, I hope that, but I, I don't believe it, okay. <laughs> um, but what by the Bible means by hope is exactly the opposite. Hope in the Bible means life-changing certainty that something is coming that you, though you don't have it now. Think about that. Life-changing certainty that something is coming though you don't have it right now. Uh, there's a great example by Timothy Keller. Um, he talks about, uh, he's, a good, he's a great preacher and pastor. He, he gives this example. Um, two men are given the same job, a boring, drab, tedious job that they will have to do 60 hours a week without vacation for a whole year. Can you imagine something like that? But they both take the job. And one man is told at the end of the year, he's going to earn a total of $15,000. The other man is told at the end of a year he will have earned $15 million. Although these two men are in the same room doing the same job day after day, they will experience their time very, very differently. The one man will find it boring and tedious. You know, it's a grind, it's unbearable. After about two weeks, he's just going to quit. This isn't worth it. $15,000? I'm not doing it. He'll walk out. But the other man will be whistling as he works, you know, happy, able to handle it. Yes, it's, it's boring, it's tedious, but it's okay. Why? Because his mind is, is uh, saturated with uh, the future. He's thinking of what he's going to do with the $15 million. Uh, so here we have two people experiencing the present completely differently because of what they believe about the future. What you believe about the future completely controls how you experience the present Remember, the word hope in the biblical sense means life-changing certainty, that something is coming, though you don't have it now. Now think for a moment about all the points that we've put out here today, that we've explored. Think about the first point. Um, do you believe that the resurrection of Jesus shows us the future? That's how we're going to be. That's how we're going to be like in the resurrection. Jesus shows us. And do you believe the second, second point? that we're on a mission given by the resurrected Jesus, and his, his mission is to seek and save the lost. And do you believe that Jesus gives us what we need to carry out that mission? Hope that what we do, we do not have now, will someday be accomplished. If so, then we can answer that question. What difference does the resurrection make? You can say that Jesus, he shows us our future, sends us on a mission based on that future, and then he gives us what we need for that mission, a sense of certain hope. May you live as a resurrection person in this life, a person who has seen the future in Jesus, a person who's been sent to do his will and has been given the hope to see it through. What a difference the resurrection makes. Amen.
precious Savior, whom yet unseen we love. O name of might and favor, all other names above, we worship thee, we bless thee, to thee alone we sing. We praise thee and confess thee, our holy Lord and King. O bringer of salvation, who wondrously hast wrought, thyself the revelation of love beyond our thought. We worship thee, we bless thee, to thee alone we sing. We praise thee and confess thee, our gracious Lord and King. In thee all fullness dwelleth, all grace and power divine. The glory that excelleth, O Son of God, is thine. We worship thee, we bless thee, to thee alone we sing. We praise thee and confess thee, our glorious Lord and King. O oh, grant the consummation of this our song above in endless adoration and everlasting love. Then shall we praise and bless thee where perfect praises ring and evermore confess thee our Savior and our King. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God of light, in you there is no darkness at all. Bestow on us your spirit that we may walk in the light, have fellowship with one another, and be cleansed from all sin by the blood of Jesus. As we confess our sins to you and one another, cleanse us, forgive us, and help us to forgive one another. Lord, in your mercy. Risen Christ, at times the doubts and fears in our hearts and minds cause us to be skeptical and not to believe. We, like Thomas, would much rather see you first and only then believe in you. Grant us your grace to number us among those who have not seen and yet still believe. Fill us with your peace in our personal lives and in the, in the lives of all Christians around the world, that wars might end, prejudice and hatred might be transformed into cooperation and love, that your Holy Spirit might breathe the breath of new life into us, the whole body of Christ. Send us out into the world on the mission to seek and save the lost. Help us and empower us to be ambassadors of your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Christ, our healer, today we remember all among us who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. Especially we name before you those whom we love, Phil Bauer, Jeanette Calhoun, John Fligger, Carolyn Brooks, Clyde Crane, Faith Heiss, Paul Smith, Ron Koch, Martha Widener, Miriam Newfer. Leroy Kotner, Jeremy Fligger, Joan Webb, Shirley Edwards, Paula Panzita, Jim Yost, Diane Brooks, Lily Brooks, Andrew Bieber, Janice Knauer, Marianne Ott, Susan Grube, Lori Yost, Sally and Al Kaufman, Ron Sumi, Pastor Ron Montgomery, Sean, Kathy Hillard, Mackenzie, Pastor Bill Jones, Kenna Green, Charlene Baker, Patty Mousley, Ed Bola, Myla Sacramento, Richard Kolodic, Susan Gallion, Marilyn, Ronnie Johnston, Olivia Wildrick, Phoenix, Pastor Fred Keller, Wally Royals, Peter King, Pastor Mar Mark Brumbach, uh, John Crowder, Martin Williams, and all those that we name now out loud before you.
Grant them a great measure of your Holy Spirit and your healing power. Be with those who watch over them. We pray for an end to this pandemic and a speedy distribution of the vaccine. We also pray, Almighty God, remembering those who have gone before us and are now in your loving arms, and we trust that they have received the promises of their baptism, forgiveness of sins, resurrection, and life everlasting. We name before you today those who have recently died, Jeanine Brown, Beverly Demier, Harry Hoy, Fred Ott, Joan Fox, Fred Quigg, Chrissy Shetler, and all those that we name out loud before you. Bring us all again into your glorious kingdom in the new heaven and new earth where we may praise you forever. Lord, in your mercy, to your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the risen Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace. Peace be with you. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are indeed holy, almighty, and most merciful God. You give life and bring new life in your risen Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. We praise you as the God of promise, delivering your chosen people, Israel, from their captivity and slavery and giving them new life in the land promised to faithful Abraham. And though they experienced the death of exile, you remained faithful to your promise, sending the prophets and giving your children renewed life in their own land. We praise you for Jesus, born of Mary by the power of your spirit, the firstborn from the dead, who through the exile of his suffering on the cross served us as victim and priest, and through him you have delivered us from our exile and captivity to sin and death 
giving us the joys of everlasting, of life everlasting, fulfilling all covenants and promises. Send your Holy Spirit to breathe new life into us and to bless these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of our living host, Jesus Christ, our Savior. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, before you, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We offer to you, most holy God, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, remembering this Easter day, this Easter, all that you have done through the passion and resurrection of your Son. In this holy communion, you unite us in the sacrifice of our eternal high priest. Through the promise he made to his disciples, we await his final coming to fulfill all of life and to make new the heavens and the earth. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. As we now gather to receive this holy sacrament of Christ's body and blood, strengthen us in your mercy and grant us the fullness of your salvation and peace. Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, happy are those who are called to his supper. Thanks be to God.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him, and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. be with you here. We may not touch your hands and side, nor follow where you trod, but in your promise we rejoice and cry, my Lord and God. Health and O Lord, our unbelief, and may our faith abound to call on you when you are near and seek where you are found. And when our life of faith is done in realms of clearer light, we may as you are with full